All right, uh, welcome everyone. We have uh, Ann Arbor District Library staff here discussing the book, Conjure Women. Um, this is a fictional title set uh, mainly during the Civil War and Reconstruction. And um, we're gonna dive right in. Uh, my name is Elizabeth. I'm a librarian at the library and I'm gonna be sort of generally hosting. And we have a bunch of other library staff here who's read the book and is going to uh, be, yeah talking about it. So anyway, this is, oh, I should say too, this is part of our Black Lives Matter discussion series. We do these discussions quarterly and um, this is this quarter's selection. So um, I always like to start out by asking if anyone is able to just kind of give a brief summary of the book so that we can kind of remind ourselves. I know some folks may have read it several months ago. Some folks may have read it more recently and um, if anyone's open to summarizing. Yeah, I'll go for it. Thank you. This book <laughs> takes can, place. I can in, do it, but <laughs> this book takes place in three different time periods: before, during, and after the Civil War. And it follows three people in particular. Uh, one of them is a, a healer, slave, enslaved person named Miss Maybell. Uh, it also follows her daughter Rue, and the. Um, slave owner's daughter, the mistress, young mistress named Verena, who is the same age as Rue. And so it follows the interconnectedness of the two girls and the one mother, um, like I said, before, during, and after the Civil War. Um, there's plenty of themes of freedom and relationships and all sorts of interesting things and terrifying things and horrible things. And just when the good guys, good guys get there, it doesn't go the way we think it does. And um, so uh, I guess that's a general description of the book. Um, it's fantastically written, not one that I would have chosen, but uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, thanks, Toby. Um, so, Yes, this it, it so the book jumps back and forth a little bit in time. Well, definitely in time for, for sure, and does kind of focus on the three characters that Toby mentioned. There's also lots of supporting characters, all of that. Um, I kind of wanted to, um, well, it's, I thought it was interesting because it really starts out with um, readers thinking that Rue is going to be the central character, which she is in many ways, but also then we get more background on. Maybell, and we get more background on Marina as well. And I kind of wanted to ask the group which storyline compelled you the most, or if they all did, or kind of which, what you found most, um, you know, page turning out of these different characters and of these different timelines, or, you know, which, which point in time were you most, you know, e eager to be reading about, I guess. I'll say it, like at the beginning, I was kind of struggling with the transitions actually between the, the characters. I didn't feel like they were totally flowing, but it didn't take me too long to become like pretty well immersed. And by the end of this book, I was just completely absorbed um, and didn't really like I think in the beginning, I really felt like Rue was ma the main character. So I was kind of interested in following her story. But by the end, I really loved that we were hearing from all three of them. Um, in part because it helped to fill in some holes, you know, like, especially when you get Marina's point of view, you're hearing things about how she's perceiving the world and how she feels. And, um, and it also just, you know, lent, like, I think the, the voices were distinct um, and it just started to flow much better. So like, I would say that I didn't really have a preference because I felt like they were all perpetuating the story so much um, towards the end of the book. Yeah, Lucy, I think those uh, couple of first person chapters or sections um, really did a great job of um, getting down to the personal feelings, like uh, the one late in the book where Maybell is describing seeing her. Um, her husband, right? Her illegal husband or whatever. Um, it was so beautiful. 
right? Um, and the way she's describing him and the things around her, because she's very much, um, all these women are used, right? Throughout the whole book. And that uh, first person section gave her so much agency and real being a real person with like super cool feelings, right? That I thought that was super important to the entire thing. So yeah, and that being near the end was like, oh yeah, okay, cool, yeah. I'm gonna admit, I, I still have some reading to do. So I may not have gotten to that part, but, um, and I it was deep getting really into it. Um, it took me a while at the beginning. Um, but with regard to your question, because I haven't completely finished it, it's a Verena is what's intrigued me, like the mystery behind um, her, you know, being hidden away. I mean, she's just come out, but yeah. Um, so some of it is a little spotty for me, admittedly. I think I didn't necessarily focus on one particular timeline or even one character, but more on the social roles that everyone is in. They're, they're playing these parts in their community, on the plantation, with their secrets, they have different positions in society and in the various societies that they're intermixing in. So I was just so fascinated with the web of roles and constraints and sometimes freedoms that people had, but everyone felt so trapped. Even, you know, I begrudgingly have to sympathize a little bit with Verena. She also felt uh, to me, she also seems kind of trapped in her role and in some ways powerless. Well, she had some power, obviously, but she just seemed like she was kind of buffeted around by everyone else in her family, just like many of the other characters were too. So I didn't focus so much on one timeline. The, the timelines all seemed simultaneous to me, which I loved. You know, everything is alive at the same time. All the stories are alive. All the characters are feeling this, even if they're dead. So I, I love that aspect of it. Christopher, you touched on um, Verena's power or powerlessness. Um, at the This is one of the last chapters in the book when they get Rue's dad, right? Because they're assuming, or Verena says in a fit, you know, that it was Miss Maybell and, and the dad assumes that Rue's father is the one that raped his daughter, right? So she writes, that's all it took to enact Verena's curse upon Miss Maybell, revenge for her refusal to heal her of the baby she did not want. Lily White Conjure simple as pointing a finger right and if we go back through this idea of rue and her mother as conjurers there's so much magical realism in the book right she tells the the woman to escape by just just fly right and she's gone she's flying away okay and rue later on admits like there's a there's a level of lying going on here. They all do between all of them, between Bra Abel, between her. This conjuring has this like little bit of lying to it. And that's what is making it real for everyone else. So then you wonder, okay, well, what is Verena's power, right? And yeah, she seems so powerless, except when she's not, right? And it immediately leads to death, right? Terrible death. Um so yeah, that just that on the point of power and who these people are, what the conjure is, what the magic is, that kind of stuff. They all have it to an extent, but that's a real stark example of where she's at compared to the other two, right? Pointing a finger, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I get you. It's um and 
and the quote that she's referring to does go back to the beginning of the book with Miss Maybell, where she does say you have to be careful of curses, you know. And I thought that was cool. And you also mentioned the point about, you know, the conjure. So Rue partly partly buys into it and partly, you know, understands that it has its own power because you believe in it. And she mentions the pepper, right, in one scene, how it's not magical. It's just there to give women one last sneeze or one last push to get the baby out. So I I loved this, this dancing around the idea. Is it actually magic? Is it voodoo? Is it belief? You know, what is it? Or is it just trickery? You know, and they they never settle on it because it's maybe all of those things. So that I, I love that aspect of it too. Well, and at times it seems kind of different, right? Because so Rue and Maybell are healers. And that scene where the woman Rue witnesses Maybell like tell the woman just fly and like by Rue's perspective, like, or at least the telling, she's like, and she's like grew wings and flew, you know, that's very different than like harvesting a known medicinal plant that probably would like help with a fever or whatever. And there was like so many different, exactly as you said, Christopher, like, you know, some of it was like, okay, yes, this makes sense. And some of it, I was like, well, what, 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 like, I, I, well, that's how I am. I'm like, well, what really happened? But like, you know, but it was fascinating. And it kept me guessing about what would happen next because you just didn't quite know, you know, or the, the, do, the you know, the dolls with that had the, that tied Rue and Verena together, all of that. I thought that like just the differences was, were just fascinating in the way that they, the magical realism versus the, you know, perhaps real medicine versus any, you know, belief, like you said, um, you know, came through in the story. I think it's interesting if you think about like conjuring and witchcraft, and they do use the word witch in the beginning of this book. Um, and like how people are accused of witchery in general and, and what happens to them. And a lot of times it's women who can heal and women who were midwives. And that's the same thing in this book. But this idea of like, is something magic or not? It also kind of reminds me of when historically people have been accused of being witches, there are these things that kind of become fabricated and overblown. So it seems like these women or these witches are doing things like telling people to fly and they fly or you know so it's it's kind of this interesting um like having that theme of like the, the witchcraft all the way through um and I, I think I also I was reading I'm reading a book about the history of witchcraft in 13 trials while I was reading this so but it was really interesting to just be seeing that again and again in this book I uh, also I, thought it was interesting oh I'm sorry nope go um, ahead Lily I think it's interesting how Rue's perspective on the conjuring changes throughout the book, because I would say at the beginning, a lot of her perspective came across to me as kind of skeptical um, of her mother and the way her mother conjured or, um, you know, made curses or healings for people. Um, and especially Rue's like real disdain for um, Bra Abel and his kind of, um, you know, belief healing. But then obviously, you know, throughout the book, she forms a deep connection with him um, and I think comes to really see the similarities in what they do for the community um, in whether you want to call it like conjuring or lying or preaching or, you know, some mix of the three. Um, and I just think it's, I don't know, I think it's really telling that at the end, the final gift um, that she gives to Bean besides obviously his freedom um, with the choice she makes is that she decides to tell him the bra rabbit fable. And I think that's like really, I don't know, I thought it was very indicative of her kind of coming around to this idea of really leaning into fable and magic and the tradition instead of the more um, like scientific things she had been on at the beginning. I found it interesting that at the beginning of the book, there was a lot of, well, not a lot, but there was discussion of actual, like, 
hoodoo religion and and those types of practices and then as we went on it was like just suddenly gone <laughs> and i'm like okay so how much did mabel actually teach brew and i never got that answer you know she does the little charms for ma Del plants will poison um bean but it's doesn't seem like it's a curse so it it I found it fascinating and it kind of left a question mark for me yes I was kind of reading it as in the beginning she was had been kind of an apprentice to her mom and was seemed maybe kind of frustrated that she didn't feel like she knew what the magic was or like that she didn't know how to conjure the same way but then sort of at the end of the book I forget where it was it was I think once she realized that um Jonah wasn't the dad of all of the kids of all of Sarah's kids and it was somewhere around that period in the book where I was like oh I think conjuring is just all lying <laughs> and I I don't know that's not to say it's necessary or it felt like Rue was sort of framing at that and like yeah I can make up whatever I want and give them whatever charm and whatever will happen will happen sort of I don't know if that's me being skeptical but it seemed like she kind of was taking that power of like being able to just make stuff up I think she owned it for sure Marissa because it it that was a key but that was also something that she learned from Abel right like when she finds him out like he's just a liar too you know but I don't think that I don't think that that means that all of what she did was was lying um you think about the situation you think about the culture and the society that they're living in she was a healer, but she was also a scapegoat, right? She was doing real things. Like, I mean, some of that's Native American medicine. Some of that is, you know, um, traditional. Um, what do I want to say? They they make the distinction. It's not white medicine, right? Because there's the Quaker doctor and the other doctors that they send for. So that stuff is like real, like, you know she did kill the kid right <laughs> with a poisonous plant like that's a tangible outcome she didn't just lie to him um but she did embrace it you're right marissa she did embrace it at the end and that was an unlocking moment for her right like i get it now you know um yeah yeah there's even a line at the very end um that i wrote down because she just says faith in magic was far more potent than magic itself had miss maybell said that all along and it's like, yeah, just you just have to make someone believe. Even when they come, the very um, you know, she tells the the um white people, like, my mistress died of smallpox. And I think she refers to it as like the um conjure a conjure of contagion, you know, like I just have to say these words and oop, they disappear. So yeah, she might be owning it, but I also think she understands how to use it and manipulate it. There is definitely something going on in how the magic works in the book where belief is magic. Like to believe is to be is, is to give reality to the magic, um, which is an idea I'd never considered. Um and I thought it was really interesting. Um yeah. An idea that comes up in a lot of um like witch books i read a lot of witch books it's why i chose to be part of this discussion but i think that's like the um the underlying theme of so many of them is that you know historically women are more powerless and certainly these women as black women living in a time of chattel slavery are incredibly powerless and when you talk about witchcraft you know there's the idea of some people being granted powers but I think part of it in most of these narratives I read is always about maybe you weren't given special powers, but, you know, in the case of Maybell and Rue, they insist on it. They say, I'm going to claim the power anyway. Um, and for someone who is like societally disempowered, I think that's a really um, important way to claim your own dignity and agency um, when they didn't have it. 
Yeah, I was just going to say, as far as agency, like one thing that they they are powerless, but they're able to use their their healing and their medicine and their conjuring to actually give other women, other powerless women agency, you know, like they can help women not get pregnant, they can help women not have babies, um, you know, and so it's like, there's this whole, you know, control of women's bodies is a really big part of, of this book. And it was one way that they could have some power against that, which is probably terrifying then and now to the people who want to control women's bodies. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the setting. Um, obviously, as we heard in Toby's very nice intro, um, it's there's several different time there's several different time periods that the book takes place, but um, I guess, so I don't want to talk about all of them, but the, or we can, but the one I want to focus on is what to me was very fascinating is this community that is still living on a former plantation after the war ends, a community of black people, um, formerly enslaved people. And essentially they've tricked Verena, who's the former, you know, one of the former plantation owner's child into believing that the war is still ongoing. And I think that, that they've managed to ultimately like trick her. It's like years, right? It's like three, four, five years that Seven. they convince her. Okay. Yeah. A long time that they convince her that it's ongoing. Just, and I had never read a book kind of set in this, in that exact kind of setting you know and so it was fascinating to me I was shocked when it turned out that Verena was alive I was because I think especially towards the beginning of the book as we talked about I was thinking like the magical realism maybe would be even more like magic so when they were talking about the ghosts that lived in the church I was like oh okay it's gonna be like a ghost but it turns out it's Verena who and speaking of controlling women's bodies like Rue drugged her with laudanum for two years until it ran out to just kind of like keep her quiet you know and so I just kind of wanted to talk about it I don't have a direct question but just like what others thought about it if you were surprised when it Verena turned out to be alive or if you suspected that and just what you thought about the the kind of that unique to me at least setting for for a main part of the book Yeah, well, I was I was surprised and it was really I was just fascinated by their relationship really right from the get go. And um, but. You know, again, I still have a little bit left to go, but um, I did, you know, Verena ended up coming to help birth the baby. So um, so that was kind of pivotal, the part that I just uh, got to. Um, anyway, I, yeah, the whole Verena just seems like a sort of like a ghost to me in a way. Um, but what did, what do others think? Um, I, 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 I had a hard time, not a hard time. It took me a while to figure out the scale of everything, right? You have this cross-shaped village of enslaved people's quarters, right? And then at one end, far away from the rest of them is Maybell and Rue's house. But then the plantation house is there, but then it's a two mile walk to the church, right? That goes through the woods. I think that was about what they described. I just thought that was, um, it was, and then the river is there that marks the border between, you know, Charles and John's properties and all that. Um, but there's a lot of, um, it's an expansive setting, right? And I kept thinking it was on a much smaller scale. Like here's one house and a plantation house is right across the street. Like, no, it was a while to get over there, you know, and then you know, you think of, oh, the church is right there. How could they not know that someone's, oh, it's two miles away, right, into the woods. So um, it gives you a sense of how large these plantations and the um, enterprise that they had going on uh, was very, very large. 
um, so that there was time to steal away to meet your husband by the river. You know, there was distance between the slave quarters and the the house. There was distance between where everybody lived that was left over after the war and where uh, Verena was stowed away. Um, but it took me a minute to get that scale of things as I was reading it. Um, they also, I don't think they ever said what state they were in. But what was interesting about it is that when they were talking about people traveling there and Ari, who came back, she's the woman who flew away when she came back, she took a train to a coach to this, but because the plantation was so remote, she could only go the rest of the way on foot, which then opened her up uh, to vulnerability of being attacked by the clan, right? Um, and so it gives it this really like tucked away, you know, Hobbiton kind of like isolated, super isolated place where these things are happening. But it's also a story that could be applied to probably any single one of the Southern plantations across the Southern U.S., um, which does make it, you know, a more universal tale of uh, antebellum war and, and post-war uh south so that i i've i love geography and stuff like that so the physical setting was something that i really like keyed in on the whole time i think it's really cool how you describe that toby that's actually helpful like to think about i mean how much thought you put into that um and i i did wonder about the state but i do think it's it's probably very intentional that you didn't pick a state because it could be any state in the South, it could be any, you know, plantation as you're saying, um, because the horrors would have been the same. And maybe the, maybe there were more places where the people who were formerly enslaved didn't leave because they didn't really have, where were they going to go, you know? And um, so it, it, and it also kind of helped, I think, to lend to that, to the magical realistic quality of it, that it's a real place, but we don't know specifically where that is. Speaking of place, near the end of the book when Jonah, uh, yeah, it's Jonah comes with the, the two other women from another plantation. And don't they say we came five days journey or something like that? You know, imagine this is a time where there are no maps. No one tells you anything. So even if you wanted to go back there to see family, it's like, where are you going to go? It's like, so Toby, I think um, the sense of uh, placelessness almost of an isolation is really, you know, brought out with this because you don't know where you are. You know, nobody knows where they are. And I really started to feel that in the book, this this sense of even if I wanted to go look for my family members, I didn't even know which direction to start in or what state they're in or anything at all. So I kind of appreciated, too, this this leaving the location nameless, because that's kind of how I felt uh, while reading it. <clears throat> I found, you know, it interesting that not only did she not name a location, but we really don't know what kind of crops or anything that they were raising, you know, what the field hands were out there doing. So you can't even infer some kind of place from the crop. Um, you're just stuck wondering and and it helps it make it real to me that it could just be anywhere. I wanted to um, throw something out to folks because what was, so Mars, Marsa, master, I'd not ever seen that term for master, Mars, Marsa, or, and I wondered about that, like the choice of it, or have they, have you seen that before? Or I've seen different iterations of master, but not that one. I think it's just the vernacular that um, like, 
how Rue and her mother and, you know, other enslaved people would have referred to him. I, I mean, I'm thinking. I mean, it, yes, but but it but it was just to me, it was unique because like. Uh, the linguistically, from what I, you know, know of southern speak there's there's not always the the r i'm not a linguist i'm just saying i don't know i just found it, it i was curious about it i don't know if there was a choice made by the author or where that came from if that was something that historically that she had uh noted in other people's writing or you know but i i just was curious about that According to Webster in the dictionary, those are used in writing to represent spoken alterations, uh, things that were because of the speech of the enslaved African Americans. The, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? The slang of the day or something. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can I talk about the white people for a second? <laughs> of course you can. Um, so we're talking about this place, right? Isolation, it's back there. They only described very few white people living on the plantation or in the plantation house. You had Charles and Verena, his uh, wife before she died, second wife before she died. So you, you extract that idea into... Well, you have all these enslaved people and very few white people, and yet that dynamic still remains. They have the 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 slave owners had ways to maintain uh, their ownership and their order the way that they need to, often very violently. And we had several very violent descriptions of what some of the enslaved people went through, right? Um, you have the white folks in the forest that kill the fox, right? They're not part of the clan. They seem to kind of just be there. They were, the man was helpful in that one instance, um, saving Rue from the fox. But other than that, his wife is also taking things from Rue as far as, um, her remedies or whatever for her own pregnancy for her own children, whatever. Um, they say very early on that the plantation house is burned to the ground, right? I'm a big fan of William Tecumseh Sherman and his march to the sea and all of that. So I'm sitting there waiting <laughs> for these Union soldiers to show up and just bust the place down, right? And even when they come, the only reason they burn it down is, right, the conjure of contagion. And in doing so, Rue is so proud to tell her mom, look, I got him to burn the house down. But then it burns the tree down. She turned her husband into the tree. So there really is no... She makes it very clear that even though there's all these white people around, none of them are there to save any of the enslaved people it is just one bad thing after another right and i think sometimes in media or in um common discourse we get that idea of the the white savior you know oh we got to go and save detroit because those people can't do it for themselves right which is a very backwards way of thinking so as much as i was rooting for them to come in and just fuck shit up <laughs> when they did it didn't mean anything, right? Because it still was a net negative on the lives of the people there. Um, and so I thought that was really interesting. Uh, Charles going out like a coward was not unexpected, right? Uh, he couldn't even shoot himself, right? He had to poison himself, or so, so the story says. Um, and then even when you get to like the minstrel show, the party when Rue's trapped in the box, which is a great juxtaposition of her mom being in the jail for the, the three days. Um, all of that was stealing black culture, making fun of black culture. And then ultimately 
um, right? Rue's dad ends up taking the blame for Verena being raped by a white man, right? And so there's not a ton of, there's not really very much redeeming for any of the white characters in the entire book. And I think that was on purpose because like I said, that white, white savior thing is injected into so much media um, that the author, I think, truly decided to keep that out. Um, like I said, again, I was so excited for them to burn the house down and it didn't mean anything, right? It was, it was, it was a bad thing that happened. So um, even the description of the Quaker doctor who everyone, right? You think of, oh yeah, okay, the Quakers, the friends, right? They were uh, abolitionists, neutral, right? In the, in the war. And when he's treating Rue for her pregnancy, like, that was terrifying, right? Like it's dark. You see him with his beard, his sunken eyes and all that. Um, so I just thought it was really interesting that there was really no redemption for any of the the white characters in the entire uh in the entirety of the book. So of the book, I think about the doll, um, the way that Maybell binds Verena and Rue is like because the white people, this family running the plantation, they have bought up more and more and more land. So they have consolidated their power. They're giving themselves more power in so many ways, but it also makes them vulnerable. Um, and like, to your point, Toby, there's less of them, but like who is creating their food? You know, Verena is 100% at the mercy of Rue for seven years feeding her. Um, and it, I think it's, interesting to me the way that clearly becomes true like with the family in the woods who shoot the fox and they are reliant on rue um and i don't know i don't i don't think i've ever read a book before where uh i felt like there was kind of both the um and formerly enslaved people and some of the white folks that they were around were equally not really about the Union Army. Like there's just such fear of the North and of the unknown and of people coming in to mess up the dynamic happening in this town, you know, that Rue is so afraid of anyone coming in, in part because they don't want Farina to be found, but also they're just like, we are a self-sustaining unit um, and anything outside of that is a threat. I don't know. I just think it, it had, um, not being super eloquent, but the way it explained uh, how the people working the plantation and the people living there were really interdependent on one another in ways that are made me really uncomfortable, but like are true for their survival. Just building on that, I think the most salient point of the book for me, and this is the first fictional book I've read about slavery, I just loved these complicated relationships. Uh, Toby, you mentioned that there were so few uh, plantation owners, or the family was so small, or the people running the plantation were so few. There's the scene where they're waiting for the fiancé to show up in his carriage, and they bring out all the enslaved people and they're all waiting there and it's hot and they're getting tired and they're waiting over, you know, longer and longer. And you start to realize, wow, just a handful of people can keep everyone else down because they've just assumed this power and they've used terrorist means to keep people afraid. But you know, that's how people are. It's like, I'm not going to be the first one to go up and strangle Charles and hope that everyone else joins me, you know. Uh, so I just thought seeing that was fascinating. And also, Lily, something you said about uh, Verena uh, and the complicated relationships between people, this relationship between Rue and Verena just fascinated me. They're playmates, they're friends on one level, despite what Rue's mother says. And yet, when it comes down to it, Verena can just dispose of, beat, uh, humiliate Rue whenever she wants to. And so I, I, 
I, I was happy to read this book and get a much more complicated sense of what this time must have been like. I feel like I I agree. And what I appreciate one of the things I appreciated most about the book was I think it helped me understand. Christopher, you touched on this earlier, but how much white enslavers used black people's lack of knowledge to make it all work, right? Because like even lack of that knowledge, but you know, lack of understanding of place, like you were saying, it's like, as I kept thinking at the start, I'm like, wait a minute, like you guys can leave. Like you don't have to stay on the plantation. Like you can go, you know, but why would they, why would they, they've ne they have been nowhere. Like they, and that's how like white enslavers consolidated their power because it's like, well, it would be terrifying to flee somewhere else because this is at least folks, the enslaved folks were familiar with that land. They knew the property, you know, and I just was thinking about that. And like, you know, I think there's a scene in the book where like they get the message months later that like black folks are free, you know, and they're like, okay, well, like now to do what, like, what are we going to do? You know? And I just thought that this book did an amazing job of at least helping me kind of better picture just like the, the horrors didn't end, I guess is what I'm saying. You know, <laughs> like it's just, I thought that was, I thought, yeah, I just thought that was so interesting. And the sense of place in this book really was like, I, I like, I'm still thinking about the setting and all of that. So I think though, Elizabeth, that particular part, this idea of freedom, what, what does freedom mean? Yeah. It's, there is a point. It's like the third quarter of the book. Yeah. Where the master Charles is gone. Right but the clan hasn't shown up yet right they've kind of heard about it and part of like you said part of being able to operate in that way was having uh verena you know sto tucked away stowed away it, it but they remained and they did a lot of the same things that they were doing they just didn't have this uh, looming threat of violence you know sure, sure, but sure. every single one of them was apprehensive about it right oh, it was yeah. it, it just like you said it was like okay we're free now what um and that apprehension stayed and then you do get to see you know at the end when the clan does show up that like oh okay we're you know that this is just a new name right. um right especially um they because of stowing verena away avoided the immediate transition from an enslaved person to a sharecropper which mm -hmm. is what happened over a majority of the south it was like you said just chattel slavery under a different name right but they avoided that because of the conjure the magic in the community right um the things that they did to to maintain their community going forward um but it didn't you know it doesn't work out same way like um um Rue's dad is gonna go fight with master john in the um war and maybell says we'll get your papers because you know once you get your papers that means you're really free right uh and it turned out it didn't it didn't matter right like just, just the flimsy papers didn't really mean freedom right. um and so I don't think any of them, any of the characters really truly experienced the freedom that was promised with um, the end of the war. Right. And I think that that's like indicative of freedom um, in like a much larger sense at that time too, or or even since then, but like, it's one thing to tell people you're free but you're not actually giving anybody freedom. You're not giving them opportunity. You're not helping them realize what that means. You're just basically saying, we can't own you anymore. And it's interesting to think about the way that might have repercussions 
that continue throughout history. I mean, this is like a really short period of time that this book takes place in um, when things in this country had the potential to go one way and and didn't, you know. Um, so it's just interesting to think about, like, yeah, I thought a lot about freedom and what does it mean? What I mean, who, you know, um, and how does that translate then going forward for these people? Even, I mean, going forward continually, like this is, foundational history for this country and and you know what is the lasting legacy of of the whole thing but like just you can't just say to someone you're free yeah go you know i agree um in thinking of that overall picture of freedom and how it affected rue and and the people around her but then looking through the rest of our history and you know looking at what it is even today you know when someone gets out of prison yes technically they're free from prison but they're gonna have a hard time getting a job oh. housing food all of that is going to be extremely difficult for them and you know, it, it made me think, you know, how different was it back then? They said, oh, yeah, now you're free, but we're not going to give you any resources to help you make a life with that freedom. You can buy it for that was well, that was the gist of sharecropping. Buy it from it's 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 debting, right? Buy it from us and then you'll pay us back with what you grow. But, it, you know, we've got interest. So it's all scheme scam. Um, I do, before we close, want to ask about the end of the book. It skips far ahead in time to the 1920s. Rue's an old woman um, who's having an ail ailments and um, has been in and out of the hospital. I don't, you know, seen various doctors. Um, and it's kind of implied that a doctor walks in and perhaps it's been wanted to hear what people thought about that and what people thought of that jump at the end and just kind of, um, yeah, I guess I just wanted to end with the end, I guess, <laughs> before we wrap things up and hear what people thought or if you thought it was Bean or any of that. Well, I'm going to think. Definitely... Oops, sorry, Beth, go ahead. No, it's okay. I would... You go ahead. Okay. I immediately thought it was Bean, um, just based on the description of him and how he seemed to know her. And then when he actually said, like, let's go walking or however he actually put it. But that to me said, oh, yeah, definitely this is him. And he is helping Rue through the end of her life like she helped him through the beginning of his Also, sorry, Beth, that you have yet to find this out. But... I know, but that's cool. I mean, I, I still want, that's great. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit cheesy. I'll say that. I kind of Thanks, wish Lily. that it had ended without the jump forward. But um, I think if you were going to do that, what Val said, you know, choosing to end on Bean's words where he is not going to heal her. This whole book has been about her trying to heal people or maybe poison them and then maybe heal them again and then maybe poison them again, whether it's Verena or Abel or Bean himself, right? Like she's constantly trying to seek power by intervention again and again, one way or the other. And so for the very end of the book, for her to be in a place where she's like, I don't want any intervention, I want to just let things happen and being to come in and be like, and I just want to witness that with you. I just want to walk with you through that. I think that's um, nice for them both to come to a place of being able to be at peace with their surroundings and their life instead of constantly trying to change it and fight against it. So it redeemed it a little bit for me, but I think I'd still like it better without. I'm with you, Lily. I, I think that was an editor's choice. We got to end this one on a high note. <laughs> Yeah, it, it felt extra. Just based on what you said, I mean, and hearing it, and it, I, I would agree. Just you know that it was publisher editor trying to sweeten it, sweeten it up.
Well, and it's a little interesting, right? Because like, I don't, I felt like it didn't need that. I thought that the book had been fascinating. I thought the characters were rich and well-developed. And I felt like I could, I would have been fine having things left up to the imagination of what happened, you know? Um, So, and because so much in the book had, right? We, there was a lot of self-interpretation that one could do about events that were happening. So I felt like it was surprising to, have it so kind of well first of all just like to jump ahead that far you know to be like yep this is you know I mean if you I did read a few reviews where people were like oh I don't know if it was Bean to me it seemed like it was Bean but you know okay so Bean's a doctor Rue lived a long life all great but it just it was interesting to me that they perhaps the publisher forced that in towards the end but I guess ending somewhat happily is not a crime (laughs) It, it almost felt like a completely different writer, didn't it? In tone and pacing and everything. Yeah, I, I, Lily, I appreciate what you said. That was said very well, you know, both sides of it. But I, I agree that it could almost have just been left off and we could have just imagined the ending. You know, f- funny you said that, Christopher, just because there was one of the chapters, I, I read most of it, but there were a couple uh, chapters today that I listened to, but um, one one just, it did not sound like the same writer. It was a little earlier on, but it just seemed, and maybe it was meant to be that because I guess one of the reviews I read was that the author took some uh, writings from other um, uh, slave you know, writings. Oh, memoirs. Oh, so after and I, once I read that because I, I think it, anyway, just in the process of me reading it, cramming it in today, um, it did it did it threw me. There was a chapter that just kind of threw me because it was not the same voice. <clears throat> but my final question to everyone is if you would uh, recommend this to other readers i always like to know so i don't know would would you would you recommend it i would recommend it i i i had some time in the beginning where i wasn't sure and i just really ended up um thinking it was it was just really well written i thought and um i mean the ending aside you know uh, and it just really taking a small part of history but not just looking at the broad strokes you know really giving us some details and I think that's unique for a book um that is written about you know like interbellum south or slavery um so I would I would highly recommend it yeah I would recommend this book to anybody if you are looking for a book that is literary and blends historical fiction with magical realism, check out this book. If that's not what you're looking to read at this time, read something else. (laughs) Yeah, I I was thinking the same thing. I'd recommend it, but more, probably to a more specific audience. You know, somebody who's actually looking for a historical fiction book set in that time period or something. I'm not just going to go out and tell everybody that they need to read this book because there's a lot of people who wouldn't understand it, you know, um, or wouldn't like what they read. And it was really well written. It was good. Um, I think I told a friend last night, it was intriguing, but I'm not sure I actually liked it. (laughs) (laughs) And yet, I'd still recommend it. Um, I was telling my friends as I was reading it, it felt like Toni Morrison light, almost, where I was like, I think if you haven't read Beloved, I think you should just read Beloved, actually. But if you've already read that, then maybe you should read this. But the the particular blend of the subject matter, but also the style and the magical realism, I think was in many ways kind of an ode to her work. Um, So... Yeah, if you like Morrison, maybe read it. I was just going to say that, Lily. I was going to say, like, if you wish that Toni Morrison had written more, you know, um, this would be a good continuation. I think it's also a book that kind of demands to be engaged with in a different way. So, like, if you're a casual reader, you if you're not, 
thinking about it very deeply, it might not. I don't know if it's kind of the genre that you like, maybe you're still going to love it. But for me, it um, like I got a lot more out of it from like our discussion and thinking about it. And, you know, there's so much, as Jacob said, literary things in there that you can like analyze to death if you wanted to, which I think is really valuable. Definitely like an important read, but also I did struggle a little bit to like, I felt like I read it for a really long time. <laughs> All right. Well, if we have no further comments, I will just say thank you all so much for participating. And um, it really is great to have these discussions. And I love hearing everyone's uh, perspective on, a, on all the titles that we read. But this was a great one for this. So um, thank you for taking the time to read it and for being here today. And thanks to anyone who chooses to view our discussion. And we hope you read Conjure Women if you would like to.